The global confrontation between the Soviet Union and the USA forced the two countries to constantly improve and increase their military capabilities. The best minds on both sides of the Iron Curtain were involved in the creation of new different types of weapons, be it small arms or ballistic missiles. Sometimes one country was taking a lead in this armaments race, sometimes it was the other. The United States, as an example, left the USSR behind in developing the fourth generation fighters then was necessary for the Soviet Union to catch up and outdo America. But when almost everything was ready for the new Soviet Su-27 fighter tests, it turned out that this aircraft could not be able to surpass its opponent, the American F-15 fighter. To change the situation, some urgent measures had to be taken. Many could foresee that scenario. In the Sukhoi Design Bureau, the aircraft chief designer, Mikhail Simonov, was the initiator of deep upgrading. But the final decision was made by the general designer of the whole design bureau, Yevgeny Ivanov. Over 30 years he worked for the design bureau and remembered all its milestones, including the time of the temporary closing. At that time, some strict measures could also have been taken. The more so because by that time, one ambitious project of the design bureau, the T-4 missile aircraft carrier, was stopped. A lot of money was spent on the Su-27 as well. At Komsomorsk on Amur aircraft plant, they were ready to start mass production of the fighter. And now, the aircraft was proposed to be made almost anew. To take this decision was extremely difficult. On the one hand, Everything was well organized. The project was in full swing. Moreover, the draft drawings were issued and sent to Komsomorsk on Amur for production. To put it straightforwardly, we actively began working on that project and worked with great enthusiasm. All the personnel were involved in the Su-27 project. However, further decisions had to be taken. As a matter of fact, it's not a challenging task to put a modern fighter into mass production. I think that was often the case in the history of our aviation. We believe everything goes well, but the aircraft is at a medium level. Eventually, we began to produce these aircraft. Suddenly, in 1978, we learned that was the end of it. Both the chief engineer and chief technologist remonstrated against it. A lot of work and it all came to nothing. If we design a new combat aircraft, there's only one way for us. To design an aircraft to defeat an enemy. If we are unable to design an aircraft capable of defeating an enemy airplane, then we have to take drastic measures. Either shoot ourselves or such losses are losses of national value. Therefore, we could have made only a better aircraft as compared to the American one. The first impression or first response was like, why have you overlooked? What were you thinking about? Followed by the question, what has to be done? I visited the design bureau, Mikhail Simonov convinced me. We had to defeat an enemy. But, unfortunately, the aircraft was unable to defeat it. When an aircraft is already in production at the plant with a lot of money spent for equipment, 
all technological processes, one has to be a very brave man to change an aircraft design at that stage. Mikhail Simonov took a decision to do so. The Minister of Aviation Industry at that time, Mr. Silayev, gave his assessment of the most negative side of this decision. When we finished the talks and the decision to redesign the aircraft was taken, he said, Mikhail, you are lucky it is not 1937 now. Had they closed the Sukhoi company, it could have been a disaster. But at that time, it was not difficult to solve some problems with the designer and the production plant. That time, everyone was eager to make positive decisions. Well, formally, the aircraft met the requirements. There was no doubt about that. Of course, it met the requirements. The design bureau is quite competent, and the designers are knowledgeable. They did their job well. But what I'm saying is that its maneuverability was not the same as we can see it now. The redesigning process was caused by certain factors. Some aircraft parameters were not sufficiently high. But now it is not so important. Most importantly is that the designers had an unexpected opportunity to analyze the initially developed rather than successful project and reconsider some accepted engineering decisions. Within the shortest time frame from November 1977 up to January 78, they succeeded in improving the aircraft performance. So what was done to improve the aircraft performance? The decision was made to stick to the general concept. The aircraft integrated circuit, where the wing with its wing root glove and fuselage forming a single lifting body remain the same. Here on the left is the aircraft of initial design. On the right is a new aircraft. As we can see, they look very similar. However, this is where the similarity ends. To achieve the required speed and flight range, it was necessary to reduce the aircraft aerodynamic resistance. With that end in view, they changed the engine unit's position. Now the engine nacelles created less drag. Outlines of the fuselage nose section were changed as well. The landing gear design was changed. It became more compact in its up position. After aerodynamic and flight tests, the optimum layout of the fins was chosen. To get the required flight performance, maximum effect was expected from the aircraft wing. On the aircraft of the previous design, the wing had smooth lines. All of us might have underestimated the aircraft behavior at high angles of attack. As soon as Illusion flew the aircraft, he immediately said that the angle of attack increased by six, seven, eight degrees would lead to wing vibration. The new wing obtained its evident tapered form. The wing leading edge was equipped with droop leading edges. When the angle of attack changes, these droop edges automatically deflect. This helps to improve the aircraft's stability at high angles of attack and to increase its lifting performance. The most interesting is that at these particular angles of attack, the drag decreased. Less thrust was required for making a maneuver. So the effect appeared to be amazing. The trailing wing edge was equipped with a new flapper on control. Standard trailing edge includes a flap and an aileron. Providing maximum lift force at low speeds, the flaps work at takeoffs and landings. Ailerons are used for aircraft lateral control. So a flapperon is a single control, functioning both as a flap and aileron. As a consequence, less weight and better structural stiff. Other aircraft structural components were also changed. The front undercarriage was moved three meters to the rear. With all these changes, the engines were protected from foreign objects. For the same reason, protective screens were installed on the engine's air intakes. 
They work in automatic mode during takeoff and landing. The screen is a titanium panel which consists of 100,000 square cells, with a size only two and a half millimeters each. In the initial version, the air brakes were installed in the bottom part of the aircraft fuselage. With extended air brakes, the aircraft began to vibrate. To eliminate this vibration, the air brake was installed on top of the fuselage. The new air brake installation required redesigning of the cockpit canopy. Instead of sliding backwards, it opened upwards. This change provided safe canopy release trajectory during ejection with an extended air brake. Another important improvement was an increase of the total number of missile suspension points from 8 to 10. As a result, there were so many improvements that one could call it a new fighter. The aircraft had a factory code T-10S, where S stood for serial, though the official name of the fighter remained the same, SU-27. As to the aircraft of the previous design, it was decided to use them for versatile tests. One chief designer relieved another during the working process. In 1979, when Mikhail Simonov quit for the Ministry of Aviation, his position was taken over by Artyom Kolchin. In 1981, Alexei Kleshev became the chief designer. As for Simonov, he returned to the design bureau in 1983 as general designer now. On April 20, 1981, the new aircraft made its first flight. The fighter was piloted by test pilot Vladimir Ilyushin. The first flight is an outstanding, even a festive event for an aircraft followed by everyday work. Before an aircraft comes into service, it must be tested for strength in the direct meaning of the word. Chronicle of aircraft tests is always full of both victories and disillusions, and sometimes even tragedies. A bad flight accident happened in December 1981. At the speed of 2,300 kilometers per hour, the nose of the fighter fuselage was destroyed. This flight was the last one for test pilot Alexander Komarov. Before that event, in the three previous flights, when we went to high Mach number, pilot Alexander complained of some noise behind the seat back. The tests were suspended, but later the human factor played its role to make one more flight. It happened in the winter on December 22nd. We had been looking for him for quite long. The helicopter pilot saw the top of one of the fir trees, all snow-covered with a trace going down. We arrived in that area and found him. 